When the Greek world awoke from its 4th century power nap of the so-called Dark Ages, it did so under a brand new configuration. Brushing the metaphorical sand from its eyes and drowsily looking around the Aegean Sea, we can imagine our personified civilization startling itself to attention, astonished by the scope of the changes to their ancient abode. Gone were the great palaces and mighty kings of the Bronze Age, long since dead and buried under the cataclysmic weight of a civilization-scale collapse, hence that lengthy nap, and here to replace that was the city, known in Greek as the Polis. The turn of the 700s BC saw the rise of dozens and soon hundreds of these small independent city-states, comprising an urban center in its surrounding countryside, each of which had their own laws, government structures, and local customs, but all of whom were inseparably part of a wider Greek civilization that was coming into full form. The question we're after today is, what did that civilization do? What did it look like, act like, believe in, aspire to? What made ancient Greece ancient Greece? Okay, that was several questions, but they all connect, I promise. As we'll see over the next two odd centuries, this ascending era of Greek society is defined by a spirit of collective individuality, and that is represented most vividly in the polis. It's the definitive unit of society and the lens through which Greeks understood themselves and interacted with each other. History calls this stretch from the mid-700s down to 500 BC, the Archaic period, to distinguish it from the lofty classical era and Athens' golden age, but I see it as Greece's age of cities, the polis era. So, to learn how it shaped every aspect and layer of Greek civilization, let's do some history. This arrangement of independent states bound by a common culture is best described by Plato as frogs around a pond. In this case, being a frog means speaking a version of the Greek language, worshipping the Olympian gods, and participating in these civic societies. Now, we might assume he's describing the OG mainland around the Aegean Sea, but he's actually reaching from Gibraltar to the far edge of the Black Sea. As Greeks carved out hundreds of poles in Sicily and southern Italy, Anatolia and Cyprus, the North African coast, and the foothills of the Caucasus Mountains. That's a big pond with a lot of frogs. Across this very wide board, every polis was the unique product of a land, its people, and their customs. That meant each wrote its own laws, had a preferred patron deity, and organized their own government. Most of the time, this took shape as oligarchies governed by a handful of aristocrats, but every polis had different systems of councils, assemblies, and head honchos. Sparta famously had twin dynasties of kings running the state with the help of two additional councils, and while Athens would later invent a little something called Demo in 508, it was one of countless cities to have a brush with tyranny. That word conjures up images of vicious autocrats, but the original word tyrannos simply refers to someone who girl boss their way to supreme power without being elected to it. It's a purely neutral word, and in practice, many notable tyranni in the archaic period were law abiding, benevolent, reformist leaders who left their polis a lot better than they found it. Like the Kipsula dynasty of Corinthian tyranni, who turned the city into a key economic hub in Greece. Among the greatest threats a city could face, was stasis, the factional discord within a city ranging from shenanigans in the assembly between rival oligarchs to full-on civil wars. Cities could get very familiar with bouts of stasis erupting from normal polis life, then giving way to a tyrannos who rallied enough support to consolidate power and quiet everything down before eventually returning to normal. It wasn't easy, and it certainly wasn't fun, but that was a cost citizens paid time and time again to preserve their near-sacred civic autonomy. In a civilization where no single polis was preeminent above the rest, and each fiercely guarded its independence, competitions between cities were as critical as the internal ones, and even seemingly simple intercity disputes over land or local resources became essential conflicts for survival. When states were this small and this close together, any neighbor behind the mountain, in the next valley over, or further down the coast was a rival and a threat, and handling that threat meant being prepared to cut a fool. This, of course, is the domain of Ares and Athena, warfare. Now, the precise method of ancient Greek stabby times was once thought by scholars and enthusiasts alike, <coughs> whoops, to be an organized, sport-like affair where two tightly packed formations of soldiers pushed against each other's shields in an attempt to break the enemy line, whereupon it was GG and everyone went home. More recent scholarship, like last decade and change recent, has convincingly disproven that model by reinterpreting key evidence and pursuing new and better supported logic. This is a fascinating instance where historians are working right now on developing a new model of Polis Age warfare. The gist is that it was a brawl in bronze, and the big innovations in technique, tactics, and macro-scale strategy came into form during the later Classical era, then were perfected up in Macedonia by some twink named Alex. But I'm getting ahead of myself, and military history is kind of boring anyway, so what can it tell us culturally about the Greeks? Essentially, every core feature of early Greek warfare derived from and reinforced the polis system. See, these warriors are best known for their kit and their formation, marching into battle with a giant hoplon shield massed in a phalanx. Here, rich and poorer citizens marched side by side and depended on each other to not catch a spear to the ribs. This was not a professional army funded by the state, but a citizen militia where every hoplite bought their own gear. They were soldiers one day, 
back to being a farmer the next, but always a citizen. And fulfilling their responsibilities in war earns them civic rights in the polis. The theory of a hoplite revolution links an expanding citizen pool with a growing hoplite army. The old aristocrats shared political power with the lower classes in exchange for their vital contribution to the city's defense. Ancient Greek politics was a full contact activity. There was, however, another main venue for competition, one that Greeks took just as seriously as killing each other, and that was sports. Yeah, actually that tracks. These are the guys who'll burn down a city over a chariot race. We can't be that surprised. Starting in 776 BC, the Sanctuary of Zeus at Olympia held festival games every four years. Athletes came from all over the Greek world to prove their excellence in running in chariot races, throwing stuff, and different styles of fighting, from wrestling to the all-out pankration, which literally means all the power. That's cool. That's a cool name. Set against the collective action of hoplite warfare, these athletic festivals awarded individual glory, elevating Olympic victors into modern-day Homeric heroes, celebrated in poetry and lavished with honors by their home city. In time, those cities began competing with each other vicariously through their star athletes, but in the Polis Age, this festival celebrated a purely individual excellence. The Olympic Games were such a central fixture of the culture that the four-year Olympiad was the closest thing to a standard calendar across the Greek world. Every city had its own means of timekeeping, but say, the start of the Classical period at 500 BC always maps to the first year of the 69th Olympiad. Nice. As the games were a religious festival at their heart, the event was protected by a sacred truce, a month on either side of the festival days allowing athletes and spectators to make their way to and from Olympia with no threat of shenanigans. Any ongoing wars between cities couldn't interfere with transhellenic travel out of respect for the sport and the tacit divine threat against defiling Zeus's big party. And this all makes it abundantly clear what the Greeks prioritized. Warfare, politics, and culture coexisted day to day, but when one had to take precedence, religious observance was it. The historical in Herodotus quotes the poet Pindar to say nomos opandon vasilefs, culture is king of all. And yeah, I'd say that's accurate here. The Olympics were one of four Pan-Hellenic games, meaning they were open to and celebrated by all of the Greeks. The other three were the Nemean, Isthmian, and Pythian games. That last one was held at the Sanctuary of Apollo at Delphi, known by myth as the center of the universe and home to Apollo's divine oracle. The authoritative voice of the god of prophecy himself, the oracle advised on everything from personal life to the course of empires, counseling on where to create new settlements, and in Athens' case, what to do when the Persians were invading. Trusting one of the most consequential policy decisions in their history to Apollo's supposedly hash-blasted interpreter. This power was clearly invaluable to the Greeks, so Delphi was undoubtedly the most essential Panhellenic site in the Greek world. That, of course, earned it some gifts. First were small offerings left by individual travelers, then valuable gold tripods from richer patrons, and toward the very end of the Polis Age, the cities themselves got in on the action, building lavish treasuries on the sacred road to the sanctuary just to house the gifts from their citizens. What started as an act of pure piety, where better gifts earned more divine favor became a competition for prestige. Delphi was a truly neutral venue, protected by a sacred truce of several major cities, Helen of Troy style, and as such it was the most prominent viewing gallery for civic flexing. If each individual polis was a distinct insular pocket of Greek society, the Panhellenic religious sanctuaries like Delphi and Olympia were the key forums for a collective expression of Greekness. And that's really the balance here. For all this aura of competition, everyone was performing the same culture, speaking the same core language and creating in the same artistic tradition. Red and black pottery with stylized figures, naturalistic sculptures, gorgeously proportioned temples in that quintessentially Greek fashion. Here too, there's a balance between capturing the beauties of nature's variety and respecting the underlying mathematical order that governs the universe. Ideas that would later come to define Greek philosophy were already being expressed through artwork. So in art, religion, athletics, warfare, and civics, we're seeing different iterations of the relationship between the individual and the collective. How they contrast, yet how they're deeply intertwined. People commune in cities. Those cities then commune as a civilization. Each polis connects the individual to the whole and simultaneously has elements of both of them. Its existence facilitates ancient Greek culture and so ultimately defines it. That determines what it meant to be Greek in this society. The original word politiki doesn't just refer to government, but describes the affairs of the polis in all the different venues we've seen. Politics in ancient Greece is an art of performance and competition, so participating in that collective individuality through the city is the essence of Greekness. It's either that or the cool-looking helmets, 50-50. 
Thank you for watching. There were multiple points writing this script where I had to stifle a surge of ancestral monologuing at your collective expense. As in, the word politics is come from the Greek word politiki, which is mean uh, politics. So there you go. One day, surely, my restraint will fail me, but until then, I'll see you next time.